Chapter twenty three of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter twenty three Precipitation. The Reverend John Remington was in his study, in his favorite chair, and evidently studying, though neither book nor paper was at hand. His elbows rested on the hospitable arms of the study chair, and his head was bowed on his hands whose fingers interlocking formed a rest for it. Some philosopher in human nature says that for certain natures this is the attitude of deep and painful thought. If you could have seen the heavy lines on this young minister's forehead and the quiver of his sensitive mouth hidden by the friendly hands, you would have felt that the philosophy held good in this place. He was not alone. Seated in the easy chair near the study table, the chair Mattie was supposed to occupy, and rarely had time for in these days, with eyes dropped to the carpet, his entire attitude betokening respectful waiting, was Earl Mason. There was no quiver on his lips. Instead, they were firmly set, and there was about him an indescribable air of holding himself in check. The silence between them lasted until Mr. Remington seemed suddenly to become aware that it was growing painful, and lifted his head with a faint smile. "'I beg your pardon,' he said, I had almost forgotten that I was not alone. You see how entirely at home I must be with you. There are some whose presence I could not forget, however much I might wish to. No apology is necessary, of course, Mr. Remington. But may I be allowed to ask what you mean to do, or is that premature? Not at all. There is but one thing to do. I will go, of course. When a pastor is respectfully invited by eight of his leading members to do so, I take it there is nothing left for him but to resign. Now the eyes flashed, and the impetuous tongue burst forth. I do not see why, sir, when the eight members are leading ones merely because they happen to control more money than the others. This is not a new experience in our church. Your immediate predecessor, as well as several who preceded him, passed through a like ordeal. Did you never hear how Dr. Bourne was treated? Despite his excellent powers of self-control, John Remington winced. Yes, he had heard of Dr. Bourne, and a vivid flush overspread his heretofore pale face. He had heard that Dr. Bourne was a good man, a well-meaning man, but not in any sense of the word a preacher. Good, old-fashioned, prosy sermons, you know, Mr. Chilton had told him with a benevolent smile and had added, I respect Dr. Bourne as much as any man could, and regret the necessity which was laid upon us for making a change, but one's personal feelings must not interfere with one's duty where the good of the church is concerned. You know, of course, that that sort of preaching will not do for the present generation. And Mr. Remington had acquiesced, by silence at least. Perhaps, in this hour of painful awakening, he saw more plainly than ever before the train of thought which he had pursued while Mr. Chilton was explaining the sacrifice of personal feeling made for the good of the church. Of course, a preacher of the gospel ought to keep abreast of the times. He cannot be expected to win the respect of thinking men who are alive to all questions of the day unless he can meet them on their own ground, with as thorough a grasp of the subject as they, and with ability to present his views in a logical and interesting manner. He did not think they would have occasion to find fault with him on that score, at least. This humiliated pastor recognized thoughts like these as the ones which had presented themselves during that talk with Mr. Chiltern. Was he, then, an egotist? That despicable thing, a vain man, trusting in his own powers of logic and elocution to move the multitude toward Christ? No. He was not. He held up his head and told himself boldly that there was no need for making himself worse than he was, that his supreme hope and trust had been centered in the thought of the Holy Spirit speaking through him. But he had believed that the Lord called men of talent to the gospel ministry and expected them to use their talents to the utmost, and he had believed that the reason Dr. Bourne failed was not because of the hardness of men's hearts, but because of the weakness of his powers. He himself had not expected to fail, at least not in this line. Yet here beside him lay that curiously written letter, every word of which struck him like a knife. 
a letter which said that they regretted the necessity which seemed to be upon them to seek a change for their pulpit they did not doubt his integrity of purpose nor his earnestness of soul but they felt that he must have seen that he was not succeeding in holding the young and vigorous elements of the church that his style of preaching though excellent in its way and all that many churches might desire did not seem suited to the demands of kensett square and much more in the same strain there are ministers and ministers sons and daughters who will smile over this story they know so well the very phraseology of communications of like character it is true in this as in other lines that history repeats itself but it was all new to john remington and his heart was as heavy as lead earl mason did not await this retrospect in silence he was pouring out a torrent of words i am an advocate of peace mr remington i have always taken the ground that it should be maintained at the expense of everything but principle but i declare to you that i think the time has come when the kensett square church should listen to the voice of its large majority of people with brains and souls whose pockets are not so heavily lined as those of the present controllers of affairs do you not know that fully three-fourths of your large congregation would to-day sign a petition begging you to remain at any cost and that a respectable portion of the other fourth would sign the same paper if they were not held in bondage to the aforesaid few is it right for the few whose aims and plans are utterly out of accord with the spirit of the gospel to rule the church of god mr remington was regarding him thoughtfully and now asked what do you take to be the real animus of this letter then do you mean that even those men who have signed it do not honestly feel what they say do they not really think that my sermons are such as cannot benefit the kensett square congregation earl mason threw back his head in evident scorn benefit dear sir they are perfectly honest but how do they want the kensett square congregation benefited they want to retain the favor of the fashionable worldly crowd they want its members to be able to make their nightly feasts where wine and cards and fashionable dancing rule the hour they want them to think nothing about the wages of the poor or the temptations of the poor except to plan asylums for the daily increasing number of paupers my dear pastor the fraction which rules kensett square and has ruled it for a score of years believes itself to be rich and in need of nothing and wishes to be left in peaceable possession of such belief it has come to realize that such sermons as yours must either bear fruit or be silenced to sit quietly under them from sabbath to sabbath and make no change is impossible but brother mason consider what you are saying all but two of the names on this paper are members of the church church members it is true but well mr remington i'll be as charitable as i can under the circumstances but i know these men well and my father knew them before me judge not that ye be not judged said his pastor with a wan smile yes sir and by their fruits ye shall know them look here mr remington and drawing to him the letter which lay on the table he pointed with his pencil to a name this man furnishes work to dozens of women at what he knows to be starvation prices and when called upon to aid one of them who is dying of hunger and impure air replied that when the woman brought home her last bundle of work and was paid for it his responsibility toward her ceased that to be expected to inquire into the aches and pains and whims of each woman who happened to work for him was preposterous this man owns and receives rents for tenement houses the sleeping apartments of which are green with mould and refuses to spend a dollar in repairs and to my certain knowledge he turned a family into the streets last week because the mother a widow was twenty-four hours behind time with her rent how dwelleth the love of god in him mr remington and this man is the largest owner in one of the largest distilleries in the country unless his prospective father-in-law is as large which i surmise but do not know the other items i can vouch for his prospective father-in-law the minister interrupted hastily you surely do not mean mr chilton 
Brother Mason, that cannot be possible. I do indeed mean him, though as I say that part is surmise. At least he is the owner of the building next to the foundry where we have been trying so hard to suppress that saloon, and have failed, by the way. And Mr. Chilton was petitioned when he gave the lease to make the selling of intoxicants in the building impossible, and refused. Is it possible, said Mr. Remington, and the pained, shocked look on his face was one that lingered afterwards in the young man's memory. There was silence between them for several minutes. Then Mr. Remington spoke again in a low, moved tone. Brother Mason, I have felt a peculiar anxiety for, and interest in, that man from the very first of my coming here. I have made him a special subject of prayer, and asked that the Lord would let me help him. Then it may be that the Lord's effort to reach him in answer to your prayer is what has stirred up all the evil within him and made him so bitter against you. A man must either turn squarely around or plunge ahead when God's spirit strives with him. Is it not so? Is he bitter against me? Mr. Basin bowed gravely. More bitter, I think, than the others, though less honest. He does his work in an underhanded way and is at the bottom of this precious document, if I mistake not. Mr. Remington, would it not be possible for you, and has not the time come when the church should rally around you and stand her ground? It would cause a division, it may be, but would we not be in better shape for the master's handling if we were to come out from such positions and be separate? Mr. Remington shook his head. It may have to come in time, he said gravely. It should come, perhaps, if you are right, but not yet, and not through me. I am too young a man. The spirit of the effort would be misunderstood and do harm. No, you must try again, with a new man who will try more wisely, perhaps, than I have done. Silence again, broken this time by Mr. Mason. Mr. Remington, where will you go? And when will you go? Not surely until the close of the church year? As to the first, Mr. Remington said with a grave smile, I am not sure. I have no present knowledge. That is, I do not see very far ahead. But as to the second question, nothing is plainer than that I should vacate this pulpit as soon as it can be done, in accordance with our church rules. Nothing is gained, in my judgment, by delay, when matters have reached such a focus as this. How they could have reached it without my having at least a premonition is almost beyond my comprehension. It would seem as though I must have been culpably blind. And he passed his hand wearily over his forehead, in a way he had when perplexed and weary at heart. They were precipitated, the young man said, with stern gravity and by causes utterly outside of either your duty or control. May I ask if Mrs. Remington knows? A sudden flush overspread the minister's face, which had paled again. She does not, he said quickly. I have known of it myself, you remember, less than twenty-four hours, and I have been weak, perhaps, hesitating for a word and smiling faintly. I have shrunk from telling her— these things strike to the very life of ministers' wives, Brother Mason. It is dastardly, said Mason, rising hastily. It will not do for me to talk about it, yet. I have not your wonderful self-control, nor your Christ-like spirit. I will go. Only, there is this to say, and yet I don't know how to say it. There is a little church, a very poor church in a poor country village, which is just now in sad straits. No preaching in the town of any sort, and no present prospect. If you could at any time give them help for a few weeks, until you knew what you wanted to do, it would be work for Christ. They are hungry for the gospel. I will go to them with all my heart, if I can, said Mr. Remington promptly. If there is anything which it seems to me would do my soul good, it would be to get where there are some poor, disheartened, struggling people who are hungry for the gospel. It was the common people, you remember, who heard him gladly. And this time John Remington's smile was full and sweet. Now, in order to understand the motive powers which had precipitated this event, 
it will be necessary to go back a little, to the days immediately following the evening on which Alec Palmer so abruptly left his intended wife to her own troubled thoughts and went out, slamming the door ever so slightly after him. To say that Alec Palmer, on this occasion, was in a passion, would be to put it very mildly. He had been angry before, in his life, as certain who were so unfortunate as to be in a degree in his power could have testified to their sorrow. But at this time the blood fairly boiled in his veins. He tramped a half-mile in the wrong direction before he was even composed enough to note the way he was taking. He told himself that he would have nothing more to do with the Chilton family, that he was well rid of a dangerous and exceedingly uncomfortable young woman who was getting views on all questions under heaven, and if there was one form of womankind more unutterably disagreeable than any other, it was females with views. That he, Alec Palmer, a millionaire in his own name, and with almost unlimited prospective wealth not only, but with the most dazzling political prospects opening before him, should actually be trammelled and thwarted by this soft-voiced, fair-browed young girl, who had mind of her own enough where other people were concerned, but had always been ready to defer to his slightest wish, was unbearable. All this, he told himself for the dozenth time, was because they had put a whining, meddling fanatic into the pulpit. Confound the puppy, he said, shutting his teeth together hard. And he did not know that in his rage he had chosen the same descriptive noun which the courtly, middle-aged officer of the church had used in reference to his pastor. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Four Complications. But this mood passed. Alec Palmer was not thirty six hours older before he was made aware that it was all very well for him to say that he would have nothing more to do with Elsie Chilton. The fact remained that this fair-faced girl, with her sweet voice and thoughtful eyes, held a place in his heart from which not even her unaccountable lack of sympathy with his views could remove her. He was even conscious of the fact that there had been of late an added something about her, which, while it annoyed, at the same time held him. It was no use to think of giving her up. Moreover, and here the caliber of the man showed itself, they had gone too far to consider such a question. In the circle in which they both moved, it was the recognized thing to make no secrets of marriage engagements. Perhaps the most sensible position which the fashionable world took at that time was the eminently proper one of behaving in a rational manner in this respect, instead of acting as though an engagement involving marriage was a thing to be concealed, to be blushed over, to be giggled over, or to be covered with language which, if not utterly false, approached to the very verge of falsehood, fashion decreed that marriage engagements should be duly announced, at a convenient time, and congratulations were received with the dignity which the subject demanded. Among their intimate friends, the Chilton-Palmer engagement had been formally announced, and the usual courtesies exchanged. Therefore, for Alec Palmer to have the petty gossips of their world set on the quo vive over their affairs, whispering that the engagement had been broken off, and conjecturing all sorts of wild reasons, was a humiliation not to be thought of. Almost stronger than his ambitious schemes and his love for his own way was this gentleman's pride. Not that he had the remotest idea of giving up his own way. So little did he understand the young woman, whom he expected to marry, that it did not seriously occur to him that there could be two settled opinions about the way to take— his judgment would rule, of course, in all outward affairs, only it was so disagreeable, so like second-rate novels, he told himself in a vexed consciousness, to have discussions over such matters. But for the unwarranted interferences of the Remingtons with their affairs and their unaccountable influence over Elsie, nothing of this sort would have occurred to mar his peace." Is it any wonder that he grew more out of tolerance every moment with people whom he had never liked? Yet he anticipated no serious trouble. Why should there be trouble? 
was he not alexander roosevelt palmer the blood of more than a dozen first families flowed in his veins of course he said to himself elsie's words to-night were worth no more than mine she was like myself excited she is as true as steel everywhere and always and as for pride the chilton blood does not flow in very lowly channels beside the idea involved in that last beside he did not formulate even in thought it really meant the idea of any sane girl voluntarily releasing alec palmer from an engagement of marriage his decision after mature deliberation and having given his first anger time to cool was that he would be extremely judicious it would certainly be well to let elsie understand that it was not wise to trifle with him in the way she had been doing a little dignified holding aloof he resolved would be excellent for her to this end he absented himself for more than a week merely taking the precaution to send a note to mr chilton asking if he could serve him in any way in boston whither he had determined to go on business also after the lapse of a week or so he let mr chilton know incidentally that he had returned yet it was several days before he made any demonstration to elsie however nearly two weeks from the time when he had taken his abrupt leave of her she received by a special messenger the following note my dear elsie you have of course heard through your father that i have been absent on business it detained me longer than i had expected and since my return i have been too closely confined to important duties even to write to you this evening will be my first leisure hour and i shall hasten to be with you at as early a moment as possible i hardly know whether it is wise to refer at all to our last somewhat trying interview of course i give you credit for too much good sense to have taken to heart the somewhat strong language which i believe i used at that time indeed if i remember correctly you were also somewhat unfortunate as to your choice of words the truth is we were both excited unduly so i now think and perhaps were not responsible for our words at least i am willing to forget those of yours which grieved me i have now to propose that we drop all discordant themes sink them into oblivion i hope perhaps the wise way for both of us will be to ignore the recent past and commence anew i have something of importance to bring to your consideration something which is exceedingly pleasant to me and which i trust will not be unpleasant to you but enough of this on paper i am pressed for time and yet can scarcely wait for evening i am yours as ever alec over this letter elsie had grown pale to the degree that her stepmother who entered the room at the moment of its reading paused in dismay and said hastily elsie what can be the matter is there a ghost hidden in that note is anything wrong with alec mrs chilton was unaware of any coldness between the young people mind and heart had been busy with her own affairs of late to the extent that she had almost forgotten her anxieties concerning them you will remember that she was summoned hastily to her mother's dying bed she had been much separated from her early home and had never been a daughter who was in all respects congenial to her mother yet the summons home for such a cause had been a shock she had not realized that one belonging to her could die despite the uncongeniality and the longer years of separation mother is mother still and mrs chilton's tears fell fast over her coffin and the people looked on pitifully and told one another how inconsolable she was and how beautiful she looked in her mourning and mrs chilton came home again as soon as custom had decreed that it would do at times she thought that there had come a gloom into her life and sighed at times she felt that mourning was becoming to her and it was well it was for robert would not like her to look dismal there were many duties to society that even in her mourning it seemed proper for her to remember still the episode gave a sort of relief to the whirl of engagements enabling her to excuse herself where she desired to be excused and to accept with becoming gravity certain invitations which she wanted to always prefacing such acceptances with a little sigh and the grave statement that one must not be selfish in one's grief these and kindred duties her mind had been busy with during the early days of her return elsie and her prospects had slipped into the background 
but that pallid face put her on the alert again. She questioned Mr. Chilton when he came by appointment for her to ride. "'I don't know what they are about,' he grumbled. "'Elsie is being an idiot, probably. She seems to have taken up that role, lately, and plays it extremely well. Palmer has been away on business. He wrote, asking me to let Elsie know. I thought it would have been more in keeping if he had written to her, and I suppose some quarrel between them is the reason of his not doing so. But I asked no questions. If they cannot manage their affairs without my help, I am sorry for them. Yes, Palmer has been at home for two days, at least. I don't know but three. Hasn't he called? They both need masters. A couple of silly children playing at life. Silence for a few minutes, then this. Try to find out, Augusta, how matters stand. I'm so vexed with Elsie that I don't want to talk with her about that or anything else. Oh, there's nothing particularly new, some of that fanatical preacher's ideas coming to the front. But there must be no break with Palmer. That she must understand. I'll have no daughter of mine posing in such a character before the gossips. Beside and his wife knew that, beside, covered a multitude of reasons why there must be no break with Palmer. Business reasons, more important than those which affected merely human hearts. As for Elsie, she still sat in her room where her stepmother had left her. She had been glad when she saw her father and mother drive away. She wanted to be alone in the house. She felt overwhelmed with the burden of her troubles. The ten days just passed had been days to remember, there had been a fierce battle fought with the tempter, and she almost did not yet know which had conquered. Sincere to the heart's core herself, she had believed that the words with which Alec Palmer had left her on that evening they had spent together were meant to be final, so far as he was concerned. But she also believed that if she could write to him or send for him to come to her, she should tell him that the ideas which had so disturbed him should be put aside, that she would be the sort of woman he expected her to be the sort of woman he believed he had won, that he loved her enough to take back those words of separation and declare peace between them. Now can you understand the fierceness of the battle? Elsie Chilton, even in her unthinking girlhood, which now seemed to her so long ago, was not one to pledge herself lightly. With her word to Alec Palmer she believed she had given her whole heart. Since then she had changed, it is true, and she recognized sadly that there were important subjects upon which she and her promised husband did not agree. There had been times, especially after that talk with Aunt Hannah, when she had felt, with great throbs of pain, that perhaps Aunt Hannah was right, and she ought not to consummate her engagement with one not in sympathy with her new views of life. But Elsie Chilton's higher experience had been very recent, and there came always to her assistance the memory of that solemn pledge between them. If we were not engaged, said the poor girl sorrowfully, if I had not in the most solemn and unreserved manner given myself to him for life, and if he should ask me now, for the first time, to be his wife, I should know that I must not. But are such earnest vows as I made, asking God to help me, to count for nothing? Under this heavy conflict of ought I and ought I not, her life had been spent for weeks. There being all the time, however, an undertone belief that in the sight of God she was pledged, an engagement entered into deliberately, as hers had been, without compulsion of any sort, ought perhaps to be as sacred as marriage. Aunt Hannah did not seem to think so, but, then, Aunt Hannah was old, and thought strongly in certain lines, perhaps, without giving due regard to arguments on the other side. If only she could know without asking what her pastor thought but she shrank from going over the subject with him as being a humiliation too deep for her and perhaps dishonorable to Alec. If I only had a mother, was the outcry of this poor heart many a time during these wearing days. And yet, foolish lamb, one who had promised to be more than father and mother to his own, was leading her through the darkness all the time. Into the perplexities of the hour had come those parting words of Alec's, now, at least, according to her logic of a little while before, Elsie knew her duty. He had hurriedly and utterly thrown off the pledges she had thought to be so binding, freed her without a moment's hesitation as to his right to do so, and yet she was not at rest. 
she shrank utterly from the ordeal through which mere passiveness on her side would now lead her she thought of the gossip which would result and imagined the questions levelled at her to say nothing of the eyes from those who would not dare to question until her throat burned as though she had been scalded with the words which she knew she would have to bear above all she thought of her father how entirely his heart was set upon this union of two old and honourable names she hardly understood yet enough of his strong feeling had come to the surface to make her realise the importance of the step she was now considering also there was her stepmother elsie's heart cried out for a mother yet she was by no means insensible to the fact that mrs chilton had been to her an exceptionally good stepmother she had petted her in her childhood and lavished untold thought and care upon her wardrobe her home appointments her interests in general during all these years she too had set her heart upon this marriage had spared no pains to secure to elsie all the pleasures connected with this period of her life which it was possible to secure from abundant leisure and unlimited indulgence elsie had been all her life fond of her stepmother had been grateful to her in a sense while recognizing of late as she had not before the great void which was unfilled she still liked her stepmother so well that the thought of disappointing her in this darling wish of her life was a deep added pain what of her own heart meantime why perhaps you will be able to understand me when i say that elsie gave it extremely little attention she believed that of course it would ache of course she loved alec palmer and of course it would be like giving up part of her life to give him up that was to be accepted as part of the ordeal which needed no looking at the only question for her after all was that supreme one what is right she settled it at last on her knees she would write no letter speak no word of recall since the one whom she had given the right to hold her pledged had of his own accord given back her pledges she would not in any way place upon herself again vows not in accord with the supreme motive which must from henceforth rule her life she had barely reached during these ten days the quiet stage which follows an important decision that one believes to be final she had not yet decided how or when to reveal the state of affairs to her father and mother circumstances favoured her silence her father held himself aloof and immersed in business to an unusual degree even for him and her mother was engaged in making the wheels of her world run smoothly in the grooves which her mourning made necessary very soon she must tell them but for the present she would hold herself quiet into this comparative quiet came the calm assured letter a copy of which i have given you a letter in which the writer claimed her as composedly as though he had not of his own accord thrown her off and bade her let the subject upon which they differed drop for ever into oblivion an hour after its reception she still sat with that letter in her hand and a feeling almost of terror in her heart how utterly this complicated her life hedged her way what was the next step to take but before she had time to commence an answer to this question there came an interruption another note the gentleman was waiting for an answer the servant said elsie did not recognize the writing but made haste to read miss chilton dear friend your little nelly is dying i do not think that she can live through the evening her mother tells me that since yesterday morning she has begged for you almost constantly so distressed was the poor mother that this morning she sent a messenger to your father's office praying you to come to the child i assured her that you could not have received the word or you would have been there i shall take the liberty to wait at your door for an answer to this in hope that you will permit me to take you at once to foundry street i pray god that we may not be too late to grant the poor little sufferer's last pitiful wish sincerely earl mason before this note was fairly read elsie was on her way downstairs mr mason she said hurriedly what am i to do my father has forbidden me going to nelly's home again it is the only thing which has kept me from her my father is not at home and i fear i cannot reach him in time what ought i to do my dear friend you promised to come again and the child is dying there can be no possible harm in your keeping your word your father must be misinformed as to the locality it is a perfectly decent street 
though the people living on it are so wretchedly poor, the drunken men who find their homes there are not on the street in the daytime. As for the poor father, he is in no state to do you harm now. He is utterly crushed with grief and remorse. Miss Chilton, I will pledge my word that you shall not be annoyed in any way. Elsie had turned toward the stairs again before his sentence was concluded. Thank you, she said quietly. I will be ready in a moment. Jean, to the servant in waiting, say to Mamma when she returns that I have gone to Foundry Street with Mr. Mason to see my little Nellie. She is dying. They sent for me this morning and I did not receive word. Tell Mamma I will return as soon as I can, but she need not be anxious about me. Mr. Mason will see that I am taken care of. Very soon thereafter, Mrs. Chilton, having dropped her husband at the office and picked up Alec Palmer, alighted with that gentleman from her carriage and led the way to her own door. Take a seat in the library, Alec. You will be less liable to interruption there. Jean, say to Miss Elsie that Mr. Palmer is here. Miss Elsie's out, ma'am, said Jean, awaiting further orders. Out, repeated the lady in dismay. Are you sure? I understood her that she was not going out at all this afternoon. Yes, ma'am, I'm quite sure. She went a little while ago. She was called away, ma'am. It is a little girl, one of her Sunday children, and she is dying. She wanted Miss Elsie bad. I heard him say so myself. Heard whom say so? Why do you not speak so that I can understand you? Mr. Mason, ma'am, he came for her, and she said to tell you she would come back as quick as she could, and you were not to worry, because Mr. Mason would take care of her. I believe in my soul she is infatuated with that fellow. It was Mr. Palmer who muttered this sentence. He had not gone into the library, but lingered in the hall and heard Jean's story. Even Mrs. Chilton was displeased. She waited only for the retreating form of Jean to be lost to sight, then said, Softly, Alec, softly. You forget that you are speaking of our daughter. That is not a sentence which Elsie's father would like to hear you utter. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Chilton. I hardly know what I am saying. I have been through a fearful ordeal since I last saw you. I do not know. Come into the library, please, and let me talk to you. An hour later the dinner bell sounded in the hall, and Mr. Palmer and his hostess came out from the library. No, I will not stay to dinner, he said. I am not in the mood. I will come again, perhaps. Or suppose you say to Elsie that at any time when she is at leisure to see me, she might send me word. Do not be foolishly hard on the child, Alec. She is very much attached to her little scholars, and is easily wrought upon in any way. You must make all due allowance for the peculiar influence under which she has been drawn. I confess I shall be glad when it is removed. It shall be removed, the gentleman said, bitterly, with an ominous drawing down of his eyebrows. But you must not be rash or unduly in haste, Alec, said Mrs. Chilton, a little anxiously. Such matters will not bear precipitancy. Good evening, said the young man, still gloomily and with drawn eyebrows. He looked as though he did not care how rash he was, nor how soon Kansas Square Church had a vacant pulpit. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. • Chapter Twenty Five A Modern Martyr. The Elsie Chilton of a year ago would have shuddered at the bare suggestion of herself being summoned to a forlorn tenement house in a back street of the city to stand by a dying bed. She had especially shrunk from the thought and presence of death and had seen a face where he had set his seal but once or twice in her life. During these last months she had come to look upon the going out of this life into another with different feelings. Christ was to her no longer far off and impalpable, but a real friend and redeemer who had delivered her from the bondage of the fear of death, so far as herself was concerned. And yet she reflected as she drew near the house that it was a grand and solemn mystery— this departure of a soul from a body, and if there should be suffering connected with it, how could she bear to see a little child in agony? Despite a great effort at self-control, she was pale and trembling when she entered the room. But there was no need for fear here. 
like a drooping white lily the child lay back among her pillows sweetly breathing her life out as quietly as a flower passes away the time for suffering was past and the little face had taken on that look of sweet content which the parting soul sometimes leaves behind when the veil has been lifted and a glimpse of the glory to come has dawned upon it if pity were needed it was for the father the strong man who knelt by the foot of the bed his whole form shaking with repressed sobs and groans can any agony be greater than that of remorse teacher has come said nelly's mother the brown eyes opened then and rested with a glad look on the one she had so longed for jesus has come for me the faint little voice whispered as elsie bent over her i love you teacher and the eyes closed again there came a long quivering breath and they thought she was gone but she opened wide her eyes once more searching for her father and her voice rang out clear and strong as if new strength had been given for the last sweet mission papa take me she said sitting down on the bed he lifted her head in his arms she smiled up into his face murmuring dear papa then lying back as if satisfied whispering sing jesus lover then with stillness for a moment broken only by sounds of weeping then elsie's voice at first choked by sobs but gaining the mastery of itself went out in the sweet clear notes of the old love song which had so comforted god's saints during the last hundred years jesus lover of my soul let me to thy bosom fly elsie paused after the first verse but the eyes unclosed again and cast a pleading look and the low sweet music went on through the whole hymn with the last notes little nelly looked about on them all smiled a good-bye and was gone her spirit risen to that eternity so far away we are apt to think and yet quite so near to each of us the hymn was not one the singer would have chosen and she thought the choice a strange one for a child but she did not know that it was the lullaby song which had fallen first on nelly's baby ears and that from that hearing it all through the years she loved it better even than her favorite sabbath school hymns and then the spirit who put it into nelly's heart to ask for it is wise it was not a mere happening this was the hymn her father and mother had sung together before she could remember it was when george forbes was a sober industrious man who feared god and kept the commandments when he loved his home and sat and sang by the fireside with his wife the wife had sung it when her heart was breaking how her soul had gone up to god again and again in low sad song in the words other refuge have i none hangs my helpless soul on thee leave ah leave me not alone still support and comfort me the singing was rarely sweet the consummation of true art each word being articulated perfectly and it accomplished that whereunto it was sent comforted the sad mother and brought deep conviction to the sinning father it did more for george forbes with that precious head in his arms and the hymn sacred to such dear memories sounding in his ears he sent up a swift prayer of contrition and faith which sprang into his heart in the very words of the hymn vile and full of sin i am it was heard and he was saved because the prayer was a real one and because it is written if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the few words of prayer that mr mason spoke seemed to recognize what had gone on in the heart of the man and to bear him in strong faith to god while he pleaded for comfort and strength and guidance to be bestowed upon those who needed god's loving thought in their sorrow elsie joining her heart in the petitions could rise for the moment above her own griefs and rejoice that into the midst of this sorrow and trouble it was possible for the peace of heaven to descend mr mason and elsie were silent as they went on their way each busy with thoughts stirred by the scene they had just witnessed elsie brought face to face with the sad tragedy again experienced the same rush of indignant feeling when she remembered the cause of it all 
and a deep blush of shame dyed her cheek at the thought that her own father was not free from guilt in the matter, and that the man whom she had promised to marry had signed a petition asking that the poison which crazed the brain of this wretched father might continue to tempt him. Alec Palmer was again brought into unfavorable contrast with this other one, who went about battling the wrong and comforting the sorrowing. If Alec had been in the habit of prayer, could he have gone so far wrong? But her father prayed in the family and social meeting, and yet he, too, seemed to be on the wrong side of this question. "'Life is so very different from what I used to suppose,' she said, speaking suddenly out of her thoughts. "'The world is filled with sorrow and wrongdoing.' Mr. Mason cast a pitying glance at the troubled face. Perhaps he ought not to have brought to her any added burden. He had noticed during the last weeks that the carefree expression was gone from her, and an anxious look seemed to have taken its place. He believed that women should be brave and helpful in the conflicts of life, yet somehow he felt an instinctive desire to shield this one from its rough places. They were so new to her, and she seemed so guileless, so grieved and surprised at sin and inconsistency. "'You are forgetting, Miss Chilton,' he said, smiling, "'that with most of us the bright days far outnumber the dark ones, "'and you do not remember the multitude who are engaged in right-doing. "'Yes, it, it sounds like an ungrateful speech, I know, "'but it has all come to me suddenly. "'I think I must have been asleep these years. "'Mr. Mason, I am so perplexed. "'How do you account for it that good men see things so differently?' How can they pray thy kingdom come, and then do not do every possible thing to put sin out of the land? How can they vote for license and rent buildings for liquor selling? Are they to be called hypocrites? You have asked me some hard questions. At least, they would be if there were not an explanation. I do not think we would be justified in denouncing as hypocrites all men who hold what we consider erroneous views on certain questions. Some are blinded. We must not ignore the fact that Satan is very busy in this world. I have not a doubt but that he planned the liquor traffic from beginning to end, that it is one of the chief means on which he depends to deceive and destroy souls. What could be more satanic than to deliberately, for money, set up to sell an article which always harms the one who takes it? What more cunning device could be invented than to put into the hearts of Christians to tamper and dally with this sin instead of laying an axe to the root of the tree. I grow impatient at the manner in which we deal with it, at the slow progress we make. If all Christians were of one heart and one voice in this question, we could put away the evil. It is indeed humiliating that it is they who block the wheels. When some good men bestir themselves on this subject, that arch-deceiver is at hand, and he works largely through politicians. How he must laugh for very glee to see God's people helping to regulate sin, licensing it, using its revenues to build almshouses, inebriate asylums, and prisons. How he mocks when they rejoice that the saloons in their town are cut down from fifty to ten, counting it a long step in progress. Satan can send souls to eternal ruin through one saloon, and when even Christian ministers who see other things so clearly have the veil over their eyes, too, when some of them in high places drink wine themselves, and declare to young men, beer is no more injurious than tea, is he not satisfied, exultant, especially when the thing goes on and on through the generations? But the end will come. It does not require much of a prophet to foresee that a crisis is not ages off. There will be a fierce conflict. Perhaps it will come in our day, Miss Chilton." We may be martyrs for the truth's sake. It has come. I am one, she said, with a tremble in her voice. I... And then she closed her lips. Her father's name should never be mentioned in connection with blame, and that other trouble, she could not speak of that. Can I serve you in any way? Mr. Mason asked, with a touch of reverence in tone and manner which Elsie noticed. Alec Palmer was authority in all matters pertaining to good form, yet his manner lacked that indefinable something which people of fine perceptions recognize and appreciate, and there was about him a trace of condescension, even to his superiors. He had grown up believing that people and things were created to minister to his enjoyment and his convenience. He reverenced nobody so much as himself. Yes, she said, after a moment's silence, trying to steady her voice. You can. 
I will say in confidence to you that I am in great perplexity and sorrow, partly on account of this subject, and I wish you would pray for me and for two of my friends who are blinded in the way you speak of. I will, he said heartily, and will beside do your bidding in any way in which you will trust me. But do not be cast down, my friend. Remember, he says, he shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall be no evil touch thee. Seven in the scriptures, you know, stands for completeness, that covers all troubles, and he is able. I never knew what the verse meant before. Thank you. I will try to remember, Elsie said, as she bade him good night at her own door. She went in with the thought in her mind that Mr. Mason always lifted her up out of self and made her stronger. She needed all comforting suggestions, for a storm awaited her. Her father was more angry than she had ever seen him, and her stepmother did not as usual try to mollify him and shield Elsie in order to make the evening pass pleasantly. She herself, too, was much displeased. When Mr. Chilton was angry, he was always sternly quiet for a time. His daughter knew as soon as she saw his white, set face that there was fresh cause for trouble. It was a pleasant, home-like room to which she came. The grate glowed brightly, the lamp was softly shaded, and easy chairs stood invitingly about the fire. Such a pleasant room, a passing beggar girl sighed to herself as she caught a glimpse of the warmth and brightness through the parted curtains. And such a pretty girl! Oh, if I was her! Then she took up her basket and trudged on, never dreaming that in that room dark passions dimmed the brightness and the one she had envied carried a heavy heart. "'Is it possible that you have returned?' Mrs. Chilton said, in icy tones. "'What you mean by such conduct passes my comprehension. Here Alec has been waiting for you a long time, and has gone away deeply offended. It seems he sent you a note that he had returned, and that you might expect him this afternoon or evening. Behold, when he comes he finds you gone out with Mr. Mason.' "'Explanations are in order, I should say.' Elsie was not naturally meek, but she was striving to grow in that grace, and in the second before she answered, remembered, "'He is able,' and sent a swift prayer for help to control her speech. "'I had not time to write a note,' she said. "'There was need for great haste. The little girl was dying, but I left word with Jean where I had gone. Did she not tell you?' Since when did you deem it your duty to hold yourself in readiness to go at a minute's warning to any beggar's house who should happen to demand your presence? This must not go on, Mr. Chilton. We shall have all sorts of vermin introduced into the house, as well as malignant diseases. I was never in favor of her taking a class in that mission school. You see what it has come to. Mamma, pardon me. You are mistaken. The house where I went was very clean, though they are poor, and there was no contagious disease. The little girl died from the effects of an injury. I was obliged to go. She wanted me. She was that dear little Nellie whom I loved so much. It seems to me that in the new role you have adopted, you have consulted everybody's wishes but your father's. It was Mr. Chilton's voice now, cold and hard. If I remember aright, I commanded you not to go to that place again. Commanded? I'm twenty years old, Papa. There was all the pride and haughtiness of the father visible in the daughter's face now. It was but for an instant, though. She remembered her high calling and the fifth commandment. The proud curves went out of her mouth and her head dropped. Papa, forgive me. I should not have said that. But did you not know it was not necessary to command me? I understood you. I was not to make a practice of going there, and I have not been since— I thought you would not object if I had an escort, and in such a case. I have loved to carry out your wishes, and I always shall, unless, unless they are contrary to my convictions of right. Hear that, said Mr. Chilton. What impertinence! As if I would counsel you to do wrong. It is true I had no occasion to complain of you until you became overmuch righteous. As it is, you are growing perfectly insufferable. Now we will have an end to such nonsense once for all. As long as you are in my house, you will obey me, whether you are twenty or forty years old. Here are some commands. You are to separate yourself from that society of ranting women who, under cover of temperance work, are clamoring for the ballot and other unwomanly follies. 
you will give up your class in that mission school. There are plenty of proper persons to engage in teaching ragamuffins. Let them hire poor women to do it. There is money enough. And you are to stop trifling with Mr. Palmer. A flirt is a most despicable character. You have amused yourself with Mason long enough. No more nonsense of that sort. He is another fanatic. I presume he is responsible for some of your newly fledged opinions. I warn you that Alec Palmer is in no mood to be trifled with. When a girl succeeds in making a man like him jealous, it will not be well for her. If by your folly you lose him utterly and bring upon yourself and us the disgrace of a broken engagement after it has been made public, I will not answer for the consequences. I wish you to write him a humble apology and smooth matters out between you. See to it that it goes to him tonight. If you are too young and foolish to manage your love affairs, they must be managed for you. Elsie tried to speak, to vindicate herself from such charges, but she could not. She felt as if she were turned to stone. She arose with a white face and went slowly out of the room. She will come to her senses and accept the situation, her father said, when she was out of hearing. She always did so when she was cornered, but I had to be straight up and down with her. I must own, however, that this is an entirely new development. It does not run in the Chilton blood to be fickle. And so this father went on misjudging his child, not understanding her motives or actions in the least. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Six Three of Us. Despite all she had been through, and the trouble she must yet face, the sorrow which fell with crushing force upon Elsie as she sat alone in her room that night was connected with her father. To be so misunderstood, to be so shut out from him by a wall of coldness that it was impossible to make explanations was terrible. Her tender spirit quivered under the memory of his sharp words, as her flesh might have done under the cruel cut of a lash. There are not many bitterer pangs than the same experience. Why do earthly fathers, who are meant to typify the heavenly, continually misrepresent the divine love in its infinite tenderness? Her sense of desolation would have been intolerable, if she had not thus early learned the blessed secret, which usually takes a lifetime, that we may have Jesus Christ as our confidential friend, to whom we may whisper thoughts that the dearest earthly friend may not know. It was even a closer relation in this young disciple's case. Prayer with her, when she was in trouble, was a real casting herself into the arms of divine love, and with tears and broken fragments of sentences, complaining and beseeching, like a little child in the arms of its mother, so she pleaded now for her father, that his heart might be softened toward her, and that he might see every question in the light of eternity, and give up all wrong at whatever sacrifice. It was strange, too, to be asking that. She, who had through all these years believed her father to be everything that was true and noble. And now, grown somewhat calmer, she attempted to look in the face of this other problem over which she had been puzzling when called away, and from which the afternoon's experience had diverted her for a time. Feeling that the bond between her and Alec Palmer had been forever broken, not only by his words, but by her own conviction that it was right and best that it should be so, she had been earnestly striving to school her heart into submission to the altered state of affairs. It was not an easy thing to do, even after she began to suspect that the virtues with which she had vested him existed in her imagination only, and that his wealth and social position had cast a sort of glamour upon her. There was bitterness in the thought that she had possessed something bright and beautiful which was gone, and there was a dull pain and a dreary sense of loss. It could not be otherwise. Her sensitive nature shrank, too, you will remember, from the ordeal which must follow as soon as it was known that the engagement was broken. The anger of her father and mother, the criticism or pity of her friends, how could she face it all? Now this letter of Alex gave her an opportunity to escape these mortifying experiences and put the joy back into her life. He had said that they would drop all inharmonious subjects. 
Did that mean that she should be free to obey her conscience? Perhaps so. Was there so pleasant and easy a way out of her troubles? But then came the recollection of her decision made a short time ago, when she had promised before God to be true to her convictions of right. What was right? There were solemn promises between herself and Alec, and now that he acknowledged that he had spoken in anger the words which released her, and seemed to claim her as his own still, was she justified in breaking her pledge to him? But a new complication arose. This time it was in her own heart. The revelation confronted her that the possibility of being able to put things back on the same footing as they were gave her no throb of joy. That delicate something, which cannot be compelled or analyzed, and which put him in her thought above all others, had fled. Like a flower chilled by the frost, the beauty had gone out of it. She was surprised and shocked. Was she of a cold, fickle temperament, she asked herself, that she could so soon harden her heart against one who had been dear? She could not understand herself. If she had been wiser, she would have known that a fine nature like hers, renewed and illumined by the Spirit of God, would find it difficult to continue to have a high regard for one whose moral perceptions were dull, and who was so conceited, blind, and perverse that there was little hope for him. While she searched her heart, blaming herself that the thought of giving up Alec Palmer did not fairly take her life away, she reflected that this change of feeling was not of her own bringing about. She had been passive in the apathy of sorrow, and had not tried to steel herself against him, even though at times some manifestation on his part of a domineering spirit, or of selfishness and jealousy, had awakened within her a feeling very like contempt, although she did not recognize it as such. Yet she had left it all with God, had even prayed that he would take the obstacles out of the way of her becoming the wife of Alec Palmer, or that he would give her grace to bear the separation. Was this his answer? For she was startled at the discovery that even though the effort should be made, she could not put this man back into the place he had once filled. And then again there swept over her that feeling of pity for him to whom she had for months been in dear relations. There came, too, a suggestion that perhaps it was her duty to do as he wished, drop all discussion of clashing views for the present, and try once more to persuade and allure him into the right path. In other words, try to shape into a different mold the character which seemed so warped and dwarfed. But would it be possible for her to marry him? It was against nature and against scripture not to reverence the one who was to bear the sacred name of husband. If this reverence were lacking, could there be true affection? Without it, would not marriage be a profanation? If Alec should change, perhaps her love for him would come back. Oh, to know which way to turn. There was the letter her father had told her to write. He little knew the difficult task he had imposed. She could not write it. Not yet. She must seem even to be disobedient. Oh, the perplexity and the tumult. Would she ever be at peace again? There flashed into her recollection just then the promise Mr. Mason had quoted and explained to her. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee, and that meant complete deliverance. She would ask once more to be led. She would trust and not be afraid. So she laid herself down, although a clock on the near steeple chimed one in the morning hours before she closed her eyes in sleep. Meanwhile there had come into the midst of the storm, which had burst over the head of John Remington, a brightness, for in the dawn of one gray morning there appeared in his home a small stranger. It was the old mystery of life once more repeated, a taper lighted never more to go out, a new soul to begin an earthly pilgrimage. Today it is here, a little time ago it was, where? How beautifully the God of love has arranged it all, that these strange souls find loving welcome and everything in readiness, the cradle bed, soft and white, the drawers filled with dainty fashioned garments of creamy tint and finest texture, downy flannels, fleecy sacks, and wee warm socks, all besprinkled with ribbons, blue and pink and white. Aunt Hannah opened such a drawer on this eventful morning, which, by the way, was a cold one, and searched for a good, sensible blanket, with which to cover the baby, who was sweetly sleeping in his crib. She found one, and tucked it around the precious little bundle, then sat down in the rocking chair by its side and drew a long, grateful, satisfied breath. John's baby. 
having attended to all the physical needs of the atom of humanity, sitting there in the quiet room, watching, listening to the delicate breathing of the new treasure, she began a work for him which would end only when one of them should leave this world. It was as natural for Aunt Hannah to pray as to breathe. At first her heart went out only in thanksgivings. Then the petitions encircled the little one and laid him by faith in the arms of infinite love. Happy child! To have the fragrance of prayer breathed around his cradle in those first hours. Will not the life voyage be safer and pleasanter because the little bark set sail amid such favoring gales? For Aunt Hannah was not the only one who prayed. The young father's glad heart went out, too, at the dawn of day alone in his study, in thanksgivings, in fervent faith, laying all his treasures at the feet of his Lord. For the time he dropped his burdens, rising above the sense of defeat and humiliation which had almost overpowered him during the last weeks, and rejoiced in this new dignity and honor which had been placed upon him. It is strange, though, how very soon people can become accustomed even to the presence in the house of a new little being. Before three weeks had passed, this family had quite adjusted itself to the order of things. The baby proved to be the usual tyrant, but they cheerfully submitted. John and Aunt Hannah arose early or stayed up late, just as His Highness ordered, and Aunt Hannah said to John, "'Hush, you will wake the baby, quite as if he were an old institution.' Aunt Hannah looked so natural with baby's head over her shoulder, patting his back while he lay face down across her lap, that one wondered what she could have been about before he came." while John and Mattie seemed to have lost all identity except as babies, father and mother. "'What are you thinking about, child?' Aunt Hannah asked of Mattie one afternoon as she sat by the crib looking long into baby's face. She had not spoken for some time, and Aunt Hannah fancied she saw a shadow on her face. "'Why, just at that moment I was really thinking of the idea for the first time that now there are three of us, Aunt Hannah. We are a family.' Then the loving old aunt saw a new look on the face of John's wife, even the joy and sweet content of mother love. I was thinking, too, what a very good woman I must be now. Little children should make people better. My baby must never see me out of temper. I thought John never should, but he has. Here comes a must, though, a little copyist who will imitate us, for the first years at least, and he must have good copies. The afterlife will probably hinge on the first years. I wonder that parents do not fairly stand in awe of innocent eyes looking up into theirs, wondering and judging. There is one thing, at least, that I am sure I shall never do to this precious baby, and that is punish him in anger. That is perfectly fiendish. I suppose he will need punishing, drawing a long sigh as she spoke, then catching a glimpse of the wise old face, she said, Aunt Hannah, there is a pucker in each corner of your mouth as if you wanted to laugh at me. You may. I know I ought not to be lecturing on the best methods of training children when I know almost nothing about it. You have got a long step on the right road if you don't, Aunt Hannah said, looking up from her knitting to cast a tender glance on the young mother, so fair and so wise. How blessed John was in such a wife. If the world should be searched, her equal could not be found, Aunt Hannah firmly believed. I wasn't laughing at you exactly, child. But I was thinking in how many ways this little one will try you, for he has an uncommon will, even now. If he decides that he would rather not be dressed just then, it's as much as your life is worth to get through the performance. You thought he had a pain this morning. It was nothing under the sun but temper. He wanted to be cuddled some more instead of being dressed. Aunt Hannah, and he isn't a month old yet. Fact. The first thing to wake up and go at it is that old will, and it is the last to leave. So I say, when the day comes that he puts his will straight across yours, it will be a big trial. If you succeed in keeping calm and sweet through it all, you will have attained to saintship. Mind, I don't say it can't be done, but most fathers and mothers are like Peter. They say, I never will, and then, sometime, when they have been in a rage with their own children, they have to go and weep bitterly when the Lord casts a look at them to bring to mind their promises. I think the resolves are right, and I like to hear you make them. May the Lord give one woman grace to keep them, and I believe he will. Someone said, I don't know, but it was Henry Ward Beecher, 
that every child was intended to see a type of God in its father and mother. Some poor children won't stand much chance if that is so. I shall have to have ever so many talks with you about it if I do succeed, Mattie said. But just now I want to ask you concerning something else. I did not tell you all I was thinking. Do you know of any trouble in the church? This was a sudden question for which Aunt Hannah was unprepared. She and John had agreed to keep his dismissal a secret until his wife should have recovered entire strength. Why, what made you ask that? said she, while she gave unnecessary attention to her knitting. I can scarcely tell why, but I fancy there is an atmosphere of constraint about the few who have come in to see me. Even Elsie Chilton does not act naturally. I miss little kindnesses from certain ones, and John's eyes look as if they were guarding a secret. Aunt Hannah, what is it? I believe there is something, and that you know it. Tell me, please do. There was silence for a minute while Aunt Hannah took counsel of herself. It is certainly time the child knew. If I tell her, John will be spared so much. There isn't much use in trying to keep anything from such a sharp-eyed body as you are, that's sure, she said at last. What should you say if John were not to stay in this church much longer? Has John resigned, Aunt Hannah? There was no help for it then but to begin and tell the whole story, while the color came and went in the sensitive face of the young wife, and her eyes were by turns wistful, indignant, and astonished. "'If only they had not asked him to resign,' she said, after a little. "'If he had but done it of his own accord.' "'Dear child, search down in your heart and see why you wish that,' said Aunt Hannah. "'I know. I need not wait to search. It is pride at work, but I suppose it is good for us. Oh, it is hard for John to bear. He has worked so faithfully, and he hoped so much that the truth was taking effect.' and she wiped away some tears. Truth hits people differently, my dear. Some folks repent and believe, and some fly up and turn away the minister when their consciences are pricked. You know, of course, that this is not the work of the whole church. Some of the best ones are on John's side, and they insisted on his staying. What reason do they give for wishing a change, Aunt Hannah? Why, they say they have decided that the needs of the church demand a man of more age and experience. That means they want someone who is experienced enough to know that he can't stay in this church long unless he minds his P's and Q's. He must not preach total abstinence because some of the members have money in a distillery. He must be dumb about the snares and temptations of the world because half of them dance and play cards and go to the theater. He must not speak of everlasting punishment because Satan has persuaded some of the members that such language is all figurative. They don't want to hear about sin, either, or any unpleasantness. The shepherd of this flock may have a good time if he will preach about evolution and poetry and philosophy and turn his head the other way when he sees some silly sheep breaking through the fence, dancing and capering off into forbidden paths, and go to sleep when others are stumbling and tumbling into pits. If I were a minister, I would sooner preach to wild hottentots than to such a church— but there, I am getting stirred up myself. The Lord has a people among them. It's a thousand pities, though, that the other sort ever got inside the fold. If they were counted as enemies of Christ, there might be some chance of reaching them. But we must not be worrying about John, Martha. He has got to go through these things. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Let us rather be glad that he has been used to strike some blows against sin in this place. Good will come of it, you may depend." I think it would be refreshing, the young wife said, trying to smile amid her tears, to work among the Hottentots for a time. Some of these people are actually hardened by preaching. Baby started just then, and his mother knelt beside him, laying her cheek on the tiny soft one. Nobody could be thoroughly miserable with a new little heart fluttering in her ear, and a soft, sweet breath, sweeter than roses or hyacinths or new-mown hay, coming and going in her face. Precious comforters are the babies. End of chapter 26
Matters made rapid progress after Aunt Hannah's revelation. That good woman was much troubled for a time lest she had spoken unadvisedly with her lips, but it proved in the end to have been the best thing that could have been done. The truth is that plain, straightforward statements are often less wearing upon heart and nerves than poor attempts at concealment, among people unused to concealment from each other. John Remington was not by nature a dissembler, and the utmost sympathy and confidence had always existed between his wife and himself. It was new and harassing work for him to conceal from her eyes anything of importance which she naturally would know as well as he. She had been quick to discover that there was something concealed, and not knowing what it could be, had brooded over it in silence. When she knew the whole truth, she wasted not much time in tears. "'I have put my foot into it now,' Aunt Hannah said, her anxiety making her voice sound grim. "'I had to tell her.' "'Had to tell her what?' asked the minister, wheeling around on her, and speaking more sharply than he ever had before. "'All there is to tell. I had to, I tell you. There was no getting out of it without downright lying, and I'm not used to lying. She asked me a point-blank question, and looked straight at me with eyes that refused to be hoodwinked. "'Well,' said the minister, after a moment's silence, while he struggled for complete self-control, "'of course you did what you thought was right. She would have to know about it soon.' I wish that we might have waited until she had a little more strength, but it cannot be helped. Nevertheless, he shrank from going to his wife's room, and allowed various trifles to detain him later than usual, until at last Aunt Hannah said, "'Seems to me I wouldn't keep her waiting longer than is necessary, seeing she has not much strength to waste.' Then, much ashamed of himself, he went upstairs with haste. His wife was bending over the sleeping baby, folding the soft blankets more closely about its small form, surreptitiously tucking a bit of flannel about the little doubled-up fist, which already asserted its determination not to be muffled or restricted. She glanced about as her husband entered. John, she said softly, see how resolved he is not to have his hand anywhere but just where he chooses to put it. A moment the two stood, looking at their treasure, then the young mother placed both hands on her husband's arm, in a pretty, clinging way she had, and said, "'John, I am proud of you.' "'Proud of me, dear? What can you mean?' Despite his determination at self-control, there was a suspicious quiver in the minister's voice. There was none in his wife's, and no hint of tears in the eyes which looked steadily into his own. "'Yes, proud of you. You have been honored above many.' I always thought that if I had a husband who spoke squarely for the truth of God, so as to move people to a better life if they would, but in any case oblige them to listen and think, and do something, I should be proud of him. Now I know I am. He had not expected it. He had nerved himself for a few tears, for some tremulous questions to what they were to do, and as to why he thought the people had so soon changed in their feelings. These clear-cut, almost triumphant sentences nearly unnerved him. Aunt Hannah fidgeted much that morning, and sniffled suspiciously more than once, as she aired and folded the baby's flannels and pretty white robes, fresh from the laundry, and felt such a sense of relief as she would not like to have owned to, when the minister and his wife came down to dinner together in a very comfortable state of mind. "'You are a wise woman, Aunt Hannah,' said her nephew, going around the table for the purpose of placing a deliberate kiss on her faded cheek. A very wise woman. It would probably have been for our peace of mind if you had spoken the truth two weeks ago. I was a nervous coward to mislead you. Now that your good sense has broken through and helped us out, no one can thank you more heartily than I, and next to you, in wisdom, is my wife, Martha. Do you know that? Don't be foolish, John, Aunt Hannah said briskly. And you a father, too but the anxious lines which her face had worn smoothed suddenly, and her smile was pleasant to see. As they took their seats at the table, Aunt Hannah assured herself for perhaps the twentieth time in the course of the last few months that Martha was certainly a remarkable woman. After this, as I said, plans and preparations for removal from the Kensett Square locality went on steadily. The minister had already interested himself greatly in the struggling church whose people were hungering for the gospel. Certain letters had passed between them, those from the little church breathing such a spirit of eagerness and hope that John, as he read them aloud to his wife, paused to say, Does it not seem as though such people ought to have help, even though there is but a handful of them, and they so poor as to be almost discouraged? 
to the poor the gospel is preached said maddie musingly and after a moment in the same tone the common people heard him gladly i am not sure john but it would be a great comfort to be among such people but aunt hannah was silent and somewhat grim whenever the little church was mentioned time enough for plans of that sort after you have had a long rest she said decidedly one day when being directly appealed to it was necessary to say something i don't want to hear about that church or any other until your playtime is over john has overworked in this church to say nothing of you martha who will always overwork everywhere i'm afraid and it won't do remember you have another one to think about now you have got to save up a good deal of strength and energy for him he'll need it all he is going to be a masterful boy mark my word i see it in the way he sucks his thumb and gazes about him as though he owned all creation you are going to the farm for the summer remember that and then it stands to reason that martha will need to go home for a while and show her baby and you will go with her of course i won't be unreasonable if i can help it but don't talk about churches nevertheless said john to his wife with much decision in his voice i do not mean to waste this summer i must be about my father's business we will go home with aunt hannah and you shall see that blessed father and mother my darling yes we will both plan for that if possible but i must make my vacation short i am not to be an idler because i chose the wrong field for work for a few weeks it seemed to me as though i might have mistaken my vocation entirely but since you have grasped the situation and received the news in the way you have it seems to have put new life into me i long to be at work and he smiled at her in a way calculated to put fresh courage into a wife's heart there came also a letter which helped mrs remington opened it with fingers that trembled she held her father in very high esteem and this was the first letter since the news went to him he was a busy man with little time for writing his epistles were always short and to the point if he should not understand john or should think it strange that he had so soon broke his relations with the important city church why that would be very hard to bear this letter was short shorter even than usual she could not determine whether it augured well or ill the only way was to read it but her father was capable of being very sarcastic she looked over at her sleeping baby to steady her heart then read the letter dear daughter i do not know how you look at the matter but it seems to me that congratulations are in order when i heard the news of your call to kensett square church i said to your mother one of three things will happen either there will be a radical change in the position which that church takes on most questions now before us for discussion or there will be a new pastor soon or we shall know that we have been mistaken in our daughter's husband i have looked in vain for the radical change indeed the church if i may judge by what i know of a few brilliant examples never stood on a lower plane than at this moment and i confess i have been awaiting somewhat anxiously the next step because it is as it is i draw a long breath of relief do not wax indignant because i did not know what the next step would be we thought we were sure of john but people are sometimes deceived tell him for me that the world and what is more important the lord has need of men like him there followed a few sentences more messages to the royal newcomer a word of comfort over the thought that they would soon welcome father mother and son to the homestead but mattie made haste over these they were matters of course there was a pretty glow on her cheek as she took her way to the study with the letter such words from father john would prize so there were bright spots even among the discomforts and embarrassments of the breaking up meantime elsie chilton had been bearing her own burdens as best she could certain unexpected allies had come to her aid in the first place alec palmer made another sudden departure this time being honestly called away by business so imperative that it would brook no delay though it came to him at a time when absence chafed him almost more than he could endure in the second place elsie fell ill not dangerously so but ill enough to require care and judicious management and to materially soften her father's feelings toward her at least to the extent that he asked no questions and permitted none to be asked her with regard to the letter which he had ordered written assuring himself that after all the young people were probably capable of taking care of their own affairs 
and resolving to judiciously forget all commands which he had given, unless circumstances should make it necessary for him to remember them again. As soon as Elsie was able to leave her room, while the much-tried Alec was still chafing over his absence from the city, she took a sudden departure to the country, ostensibly to make a long-promised visit to an aunt of her father's, really because she found herself not strong enough to visit at the parsonage and keep face and voice under the control necessary to deceive Mrs. Remington into the belief that all was as it should be in Kensett Square. While with her aunt she did write the letter, not, indeed, such a one as her father had ordered, but a kind, grave, womanly letter to Alec Palmer, in which she gently but distinctly, and with solemn reasons for her conduct given, severed for ever all relations with him. Much tried would she have been, had she known that through some freak of the mails, aided by the gentleman's hurried transit from one business point to another, he failed to receive her carefully worded letter. It was on the afternoon of her return home that Aunt Hannah arrested her steps in the hall, just after the little maid had given her permission to go to the upstairs sitting-room, where the family, baby and all, were gathered. "'Wait a minute, child. I want to see you before you go upstairs. You will be as wise as a serpent, won't you, dear, when you get up there? She isn't as strong as she might be, even yet, you know, and going over things will just excite you both and do no good.' "'I will try,' said Elsie humbly. But, oh, Aunt Hannah, does she know the whole story now? Oh, yes, she does. All her husband can tell her, I guess. There are no secrets between them any more, if that is what you mean. I told her myself. Had to, a week before he was willing. She was worrying herself over something wrong, and working upon her nerves more than a week of knowing all about it would. All the same, I blundered into it. Didn't mean to do it. Only she sees through things so. You have to tell her. Elsie turned and descended the two or three steps she had taken up the stairs and came close to Aunt Hannah, her face pale, save for a little spot of red which seemed to burn on either cheek. "'Aunt Hannah, will you tell me something?' she said. "'I have not been able to learn. There was no one whom I was willing to ask. That paper, you know, or letter, it was a letter, was it not?' "'The resignation which they sent him in, you mean, I suppose?' said Aunt Hannah calmly. Call things by their right names, child. To be sure, ministers are generally supposed to send in their own resignations, but they reversed the usual order. Yes, I know all about it. I want just to know two things. Is my father's name on that paper? It certainly is, said Aunt Hannah gravely. It pretty nearly heads the list. The pink on Elsie's face spread and deepened. Aunt Hannah, one question more. Is Mr. Palmer's name on it? Oh, indeed it is. That actually does head the precious list. The face which had been crimson but a moment before had grown so pale that Aunt Hannah's heart smote her with pity. She tried to think of something comforting to say, but Elsie did not give her time. Aunt Hannah, she said, struggling to speak quietly, there are things which daughters cannot help, over which they have no control. I suspected some things, but I did not know— I mean, I did not believe. She stopped abruptly, and Aunt Hannah made haste to speak. Don't you worry, child. Of course you could not help any of it, and there is nobody who understands that better than those two upstairs. Don't worry about them, either. They aren't cast down. Not a mite. When a man goes into the Lord's work, he counts the cost generally, and he doesn't go to breaking his heart or giving up the world for lost, because a few men in it cannot stand his master's message. What does the whole of it amount to, compared with what the Lord has to bear? Don't go to shouldering more burdens than is necessary, child. Go up and see the baby and be comforted. He has his father's eyes. I always knew he would have. But Elsie moved instead toward the door. No, Aunt Hannah, I am not going up now. I am going home. I want to think. I have not known, to a certainty, anything— I knew my father was annoyed and vexed, and had been led unwisely, but I did not know how far he had gone. I will come again, tomorrow perhaps, or very soon. I want you to tell Mrs. Remington for me that I love her dearly, dearly, and that I will not in any way disappoint her if I can help it. Of course you won't, dear child, and Aunt Hannah's chin quivered. She doesn't expect disappointment where you are concerned, I can tell you that. 
There's another one whom you won't disappoint, I know, and that's your mother. I can hardly understand how she could be happy, even in heaven, if she could look down and see her baby walking in the road she didn't want her to take. I held you in my arms when she kissed you goodbye. I saw the look in her eyes, and I know all about it. Aunt Hannah had gained her point. The drawn lines on the young face were relaxing, and the eyes were dimming with tears. Thank you, she said gently. I will not forget. I am not going to disappoint my mother, nor my mother's savior. I have been walking a road that was full of temptation. I am going to get out of it. Kiss me for my mother, Aunt Hannah. Whereupon the strong old arms closed about the fair form, and some very tender kisses were left by the withered lips on those fresh young ones. It was Elsie, Aunt Hannah said, half an hour afterward, in answer to Mattie's inquiring look. They were in the little reception room at the head of the stairs, the father, mother, and Earl Mason holding court around the new baby. Elsie, repeated the mother, in surprise and dismay, has she returned, and she didn't come up to see the baby? She couldn't, Martha, not this time. She was all upset. She had just discovered some names on that paper which was sent to John that surprised her more than they do anyone else. It is amazing to me how girls can be so blind. She left her love and is coming again soon. Mrs. Remington's face looked troubled, and she drew a heavy sigh as she said, Poor Elsie, there are hard lines coming into her life. I tremble for her. It seems almost too hard that we should have to leave her just now. Still, if she is to become that man's wife, there is very little that we could do for her. Don't you worry about her, said Aunt Hannah, with her most assured tone. The Lord can take care of his own, especially his lambs, and she's one of them. I don't believe she will ever marry that man in this world, and she certainly won't in the next. If she had not almost immediately occupied herself with the baby, to the exclusion of everything else, she might have been bewildered over the sudden flash of feeling on Earl Mason's face and the quick look he gave her. Did it express gratitude? If so, for what? The Lord can certainly bring good out of evil, as Mrs. Adams says, he remarked, in an almost cheerful tone. He has shown us that phase of his love often enough to lead us to trust him. She's a very wise woman, he added, as Aunt Hannah gathered the baby, blankets, pillow, and all, and unceremoniously left the room by way of the nursery. A very wise woman. I would trust her knowledge of human nature, and her intuitions, where I would not my own. He was still speaking quite cheerfully, apparently for some reason, he was very glad to trust to Aunt Hannah's intuitions. End of chapter 27「Twenty Eight of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 28. J. S. R. It was surprising how little time it took, after all, to dismantle the pretty home in Kensett Square and make it look utterly unhomelike. Oh, there was no indecorous haste. Indeed, everything was done with the utmost order and with a view to all the proprieties. There was a farewell gathering in the church parlors, where many wept honest tears of regret, and some made dishonest speeches of regret. There was presented a very elegant silver dinner service, the largest donors on the list of names presented with it being those from whom it was very hard to receive gifts, but for the grace of Jesus Christ bestowed in unusual measure for the needs of this very hour, the offerings would certainly have been declined. As it was, the minister's voice was kind and calm as he expressed their united thanks to all who intended kindness. The minister's wife's eyes flashed suspiciously during this ceremony, but when, ten minutes afterward, the widow porter brought, done up in a bit of newspaper, a pair of rather coarse and ill-shaped baby socks which her own hands had fashioned after the hard day's work was done, those same eyes filled with tears, and the widow porter's thanks were such as she will remember. Of course this episode was not allowed to close without a carefully prepared paper commencing with, whereas it has pleased Providence to so order that it is expedient for our beloved pastor, the Reverend John Remington, to remove to another field of labor, be it resolved that. And then followed the long list of carefully planned, gracefully worded resolutions. Alec Palmer had returned just in time to give his skillful mind to the work of formulating them, and had spent much thought and care upon them, writing and rewriting until he was more than weary of them all. 
he was making what was, for him, an unusual effort to please, not his pastor, nor yet the Kensett Square congregation, but Elsie Chilton. He had pushed the matter with relentless hand to a successful issue, and now had time to feel a degree of sorrow for Elsie's evident suffering. There had actually been times when he told himself that had he realized how entirely she was bound up in the Remington's household, he would not have been so precipitate. Of course, he knew this to be false, because it was what he called her infatuation over them which had hurried him on. He was altogether complacent over the result of his skill, and could afford to indulge himself in an imaginary regret that such effort had been necessary, or at least, that it had been necessary for him to play so prominent a part. A truth to tell, this phase of the situation troubled him not a little. For instance, he had been exceedingly annoyed that his name had had to appear on that obnoxious paper, even obliged to head the list. Given the possibility of Elsie's ever knowing it, he did not like to think of what might result, but he reflected that it was not in the least probable that she ever would know it. The actual signers were pledged to stand by one another and keep their own counsel, and the Remingtons would certainly not be likely to show that paper or talk about it. He left out of consideration the fact that Aunt Hannah, having had long experience in truth-telling, knew how to answer only the truth to directly put questions. In fact, he left Aunt Hannah out of the question entirely, as an old woman who was quite beneath his consideration. But he had his anxious hours, nevertheless. Twice, during that enforced absence, he had written to Elsie hurried little notes, expressive of his extreme regret that he must be away at such time, and assuring her that certain rumors which he had heard relative to the state of things in the Kensett Square Church, while they did not surprise him, were matters for sincere regret, especially on her account. He trusted that nothing unkind had been done, and that nobody with a zeal not according to knowledge had said or done anything to bring the pastor to so sudden a departure. For himself, while he could wish that he was present to comfort her, he could not but, at the same time, be glad that his continued absence would furnish her proof if indeed she needed proof, that certainly he had nothing to do with the peculiar state of things. The only answer which Elsie had returned to these notes had been that long, carefully worded one of which I told you, and which, you will remember, he did not receive. Her silence troubled him somewhat, until Mrs. Chilton wrote of her illness, and then of her sudden departure to the country. The poor child, wrote Mrs. Chilton, is utterly worn out in body and mind, worrying over the prospective departure of her friends, it is really extraordinary what a hold they have gotten upon her affections. I know somebody who will have to be very patient and very cautious for a little time. Her nervous system is so overwrought by all these matters that if you go to being exacting and, well, almost jealous, you know I shall not answer for the consequences. And Mr. Palmer, who had been absent from Elsie long enough to begin to realize something of what she really was to him, had resolved to be very patient indeed and very magnanimous. He would say nothing to Elsie when they met about this recent and trying past. He would not even refer to that last vexation when she actually went away to attend a dying child, though he had been absent for two weeks and had engaged to be with her early in the evening. Neither would he say anything about her having gone with Mr. Mason on this errand. Truth to tell, when he thought of Elsie and of the look which certain things had the power to bring into her eyes, he decided that to be silent on that subject was simply common prudence. He returned, as I said, but the day before the public meeting in which the series of resolutions were presented. He devoted all his time to the preparation of them, and was conspicuous on that public occasion as Mr. Remington's friend and earnest well-wisher. It was a trial to him that Elsie did not appear. He resolved not to see her until after the train had departed which would bear away her friends, and then to go to her in all tenderness, and be the one to soothe her first hours of loneliness and grief. He would make himself as necessary to her hours of sorrow as he had been heretofore to her hours of pleasure. Then, when the time came to speak of that, he would hasten their marriage with all speed. Business should call him abroad in a few months. In fact, he would make it imperatively demand his presence, and that should be his plea for hastening their plans. Elsie had always wanted to travel in Italy. She should now have the opportunity— it was, under the circumstances, the best possible thing to do. He would hasten her away from all present interests foreign to his taste, all hateful sights and sounds which were stirring her blood to unhealthful throbbings. She should go where she would not hear of saloons, 
nor tenement houses, nor drunken, cruel fathers, nor managing, aspiring women, nor fanatical young men. She should go where there would be only graceful lakes and fairy-like boats in which to float down them, and lovely valleys in which to dream, and gorgeous sunsets on which to gaze, and flowers, and grace, and sweet leisure, and perfumed air. It was such a life for which she was fitted. He had rescued her from a fanaticism which would become terrible to her when once she was fairly rid of the fevered air of reform which she had been breathing for the past few months. So he rounded his periods carefully, and omitted no word or act calculated to show outward respect to the departing pastor, even keeping his carriage waiting, with many others, on that last morning at the depot. And Elsie, when she heard of it all, had said only this under her breath, false to the last, in little and unnecessary things, as well as in those necessary to carry out his schemes. The note which she received that evening was as carefully worded as the resolutions had been. He knew she must be worn and sad, but might he not come? He would not detain her late, for he was sure she needed rest, but it had been so long since he had seen her. He ignored utterly the possibility that there might be such a thing as a coldness between them, in fact, he did not honestly believe that there was any coldness which a half-hour of his inimitable petting would not remove. For he could be very tender and gracious, this man, when he chose. None knew that better than Elsie. Yet her face had paled in indignation over this note. Ever since that first day of her return, when Aunt Hannah had suddenly and unwittingly revealed to her something of the true character of the man to whom she had been engaged, she had felt herself humiliated in having ever been in such relations to him. Up to that hour, having settled her own part with her conscience, once for all, she had had time to be sorry for him. As she walked swiftly away from Aunt Hannah's keen eyes, she said, almost aloud, He is actually a liar. I am disgraced in my own eyes by having my name coupled with such as he. She replied to his note with such promptness that he smiled, well pleased, when the messenger came. Then he held the sheet up before his astonished eyes, and read and re-read, seemingly unable to believe his senses. Yet the note was not long. It was only this. Mr. Palmer, sir, your note received just now amazes me. You must surely have received the long letter in which I explained in detail why we must be only friends hereafter. I am sorry that you did not understand it. I am sorry that you force me to be entirely frank. I wish now to say that I decline from this time forth to acknowledge you as among my list of acquaintances. I have ceased to respect you. I have found that you can be untrue, on occasion, even to your written word. I need not particularize, for you at least know the facts. Yet to relieve your mind from any doubt in the matter, I will simply say that I have seen the letter which was sent to my pastor. I have read carefully the list of names, and noted what one headed that list. With this fact in mind, recall the lines which you wrote to me in regard to this very letter. Why was there need to soil the page written to me with deliberate falsehood? What did you hope to accomplish by it? After this, I need only sign myself, Elsie Chilton. You will doubtless agree with me that this was a somewhat startling letter for a man to receive from a lady whom he confidently expected to take to Europe as his bride in less than two months from that date. I am tempted to let you hear a few sentences of a conversation which took place in the Chilton household a few hours thereafter. No child of mine shall play hide-and-seek with a gentleman in this ridiculous way, I can assure you. I command you to write, as your mother has suggested, and invite Alec Palmer to dine with us tonight and then to receive him as you know you ought, in view of the relations between you. We will have no more of these disgraceful scenes. Do you fully understand me? This from Robert Chilton, in a great rage. Then Elsie's quiet, pale, grave. Father. She used the name but rarely. It was generally the more familiar, more childish, Papa. Father. Had you given me the opportunity when I asked the other day, you would have better understood the relations between Mr. Palmer and myself. I will write a note for Mamma, inviting any person to dine with her whom she wishes to entertain, signing her name to the note. But Mr. Palmer is, and can be, no guest of mine. I will certainly meet him, if you desire, in a way befitting the relation between us, which is that of strangers. I neither like, nor admire, nor respect Mr. Palmer. He can never be reckoned among my friends again. 
He perfectly understands this. I have been entirely frank with him, and if he chooses to ignore my words, as he has so frequently done before, when occasion offered, he must be prepared to endure the embarrassment which will certainly follow. Father, I am not a child. I am your daughter, it is true, and in all things right I will obey you. But the days have surely gone by when a father forces his daughter to marry a man who has deceived her and whom she despises. I do not suppose it is necessary to say this to you, but perhaps I should tell you frankly, that if I knew I should be sent out from my father's house to-night never to return, unless I obeyed your wishes in this respect, I should have to go, because to do otherwise would be to go contrary to the plain directions of my father in heaven, whom you, sir, have taught me from a child to obey. And then Elsie Chilton went away to her own room. She is a born idiot, said her stepmother, with paling lips. This accounts for Alec's wild letter which he sent me but even yet I may be able to patch it up if you will help me. Those Remingtons are gone, that is a great step in advance, and there is no other fanatic here to influence her. Was there not? Even at that moment there waited for her in the parlor a very great fanatic indeed, no other than Fern Redpath, to whom Elsie presently came, holding her excitement in check to hear from this friend the truth about something else which had also excited her. Oh, Fern, is what I have heard true? Are you really going to speak in the opera house? I am, indeed. I am going to do what I said I never would, go on the platform in my own city and speak to the people. I have within the last few weeks been so roused, so fairly burned through and through, with the enormity of this thing, this evil in our midst, that it seems to me as though the very stones would cry out if women held their peace much longer. I am not going to make a speech." I am going to tell them a story, a story of facts, of things which are occurring under their very eyes, in which their own sons and daughters are engaged. It is a terrible story, Elsie. You do not know the half nor the quarter of it. You do not know, for instance, that my poor boy Jack, for whom I have been working and praying, was drugged last night, and lies in a state of beastly intoxication to-day, and his mother dying and calling for him. Will not that be a story for the Opera House listeners to hear? Fern, tell me, why did you go to the opera house? Would not a church, the lecture room of a church, have served your purpose better? We thought of that at first, and tried for it, but no lecture room large enough could be secured. The Kensett Square Church will not open its lecture room to any temperance story told by a woman, even though the story be vouched for as true. Nothing less than a cantata or an operetta can be admitted there. Think of it, Elsie, the folly of it all. Last week an operetta, with ladies dressed like fairies and goblins, and I don't know what, certainly not like human beings, and a delighted crowd to listen to their songs and recitations and see their dancing. But because I want to appear in a plain black dress made close to the throat and close to the wrists, and tell that same company about the things which are taking place around the corner from their own homes, things which would have to do with the future of immortal souls, it becomes unwomanly. Oh, Elsie! Will you do something for me? I do so long to have you stand by me now. What can I do? You know I would do it if I could. But, Fern, I am not like you. I cannot speak before a dozen people, ever, about anything. No, you cannot speak. At least, you think you cannot. It may be that you have not been called to do so. But I think I have been. I am going to tell my story tonight as simply as I can, and I want a woman with me a woman to pray. Earl Mason would, but he says it ought to be a woman. Elsie, can you pray? A moment of solemn silence, and then Elsie, almost as white as the marble bust near which she stood, spoke again. Yes, I can pray, and I will. Fern, you may depend upon me tonight. It was just at that moment that they, coming from different ways, paused to take a good-night look at the sleeping king they being aunt hannah and martha and john perhaps i ought to say that there were four of them for aunt hepsy hovered in the near distance intent on some work for the young king talk about slaves and tyrants if ever there was a tyrant in the flesh his name was john remington jr and the most devoted and utterly self-forgetful of his many slaves was aunt hepsy stone 
the intensity of her devotion had its rise in what we are pleased to call an accidental circumstance much discussion had been had between this new father and mother as to the newcomer's middle name of course he was to be john remington thus much had been decreed from the very first the young mother having an air of firmness and decision about her whenever the subject was hinted at which discouraged any other suggestion but a middle name she was willing to talk over and held herself open to conviction at least she received proposals graciously enough but none of them suited her a name is such an important thing she said you cannot cast it aside after childhood is over and try another it is a lifelong companion and stays behind even after you are done with this part of life sometimes is immortal this last with a fond look at the young immortal among the blankets a look which said as plainly as words could have done he will glorify his name mark my words then i should think you would want something less commonplace and prosaic than john for him would the amused father say partly in earnest and partly to see the new dignity on the mother's face and hear it in her voice as she said i like john i always have i like it better than any other name beside it was the name of the beloved disciple you know i want my john to be another of whom it shall be said that disciple whom jesus loved then after a little middle names are important because of the initials j r that is too short we need something which will slip in between those two letters and harmonize i should like your initials j s r only your middle name is simply horrid i always dislike the sound of sylvester my baby shall never bear it so every name in the college catalogues and church records was by turns discussed and abandoned until it began to seem that there was no name as yet coined good enough for the new baby they were looking one evening at an ancient engraving a massive shield with its latin motto and its curious carvings and as they looked the minister said slowly meditatively as though thinking aloud instead of talking he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him and the mother looking at the shield and then at the sleeping baby thinking of the weary dangerous way the small feet must travel longing oh so earnestly that he might be shielded even by that almighty one said suddenly oh john let us give him shield for his middle name john shield remington that will give him the same initials as yours and it is not a commonplace name it is dignified and at the same time simple and unpretentious and it cannot be twisted into some silly diminutive beside when he is old enough we can tell him how we came to choose it the lord god is a sun and shield quoted the father smiling it is an original name certainly but i like it thus was the momentous question settled a few days later when aunt hepsy took the morsel in her arms which was henceforth to rule her life and tried to look grim and sensible and do her best at convincing this silly father and mother that whatever hannah might do she was by all means determined that she would not go into her dotage and make a fool of herself over that baby looking down on its sweet helplessness at the blueness of its eyes and the utter trustfulness with which it lay in her arms something like a very tremor sounded in her voice as she asked what is his name john shield remington said the mother promptly it was the first time she had been able to speak it in full as a matter of information she was quite unprepared for the effect produced aunt hepsy gave so sudden a start as to nearly upset the baby and said what almost as sharply as though she had been a gun and had exploded john shield remington repeated the wondering mother lingering over the syllables don't you like the name i do very much aunt hepsy's face was working strangely the wrinkles about her mouth twitched and quivered she struggled with her throat with her eyes with her voice and at last said in tones which shook with feeling the while two tears rolled slowly down dropping one on her nose the other plump on the baby's cheek i didn't expect it nor dream it but i'll never forget it never and the boy will not have reason to regret it neither will his father and mother mind you that whereupon she laid the bundle of flannel very unceremoniously in aunt hannah's arms and left the room poor dear heart said that woman very gently as she skillfully manipulated the flannel and arranged the long white robes to think that we should never once have thought of it and i knew it so well but it went out of my mind more than a quarter of a century ago and to think that she cares so much 
"'What is it?' asked John and Maddie in the same breath. "'Why, his name was Shield, Joab Shield Stone. "'It was his mother's family name, you know. "'She belonged to the Shields of New England. "'He liked that name, Joab did. "'I've heard him speak it with a kind of lingering tenderness many a time. "'He was uncommonly fond of his mother, Joab was. "'And to think that I should have forgotten. "'But I didn't know that Hepsy cared about such things.' We don't know one another very well in this world, after all. The young father and mother looked at each other, half amused, half embarrassed. They had not thought of Joab Stone. Mattie had never thought of him twice in her life. To John he was a dream of an early childhood that had faded long ago. They had neither of them so much as known that he laid any claim to the name of Shield, and here they were supposed to have named their baby for him. And then to think that Aunt Hepsy cared— she of all women indulging in such tender sentiment over a name. The baby's cheek was still wet with that one tear she had dropped. As the mother leaned over to brush it away, the father spoke in a low, moved tone. He was a good man, Maddie, a pure-hearted, God-fearing, faithful man. Shall we keep the accidental part of a sacred secret between us and consider our baby named for him? I like to have it so, said Maddie gently. I am so glad that Aunt Hepsy cares. Well, they might have been. Even she did not know how utterly unselfish and tender and patient and absorbed she could become over that small morsel of humanity who had come into her heart. But God knew, and I like to think that he planned this sweet surprise in her old age for Aunt Hopsy Stone. So they stood that evening, beside his crib, taking a good-night look at John Shield Remington, Aunt Hannah, and Martha, and John. Aunt Hepsy had been there and gone, intent on some bit of flannel which she believed should be aired for the morrow's use, only by her own careful hands. "'Young mothers don't understand. How should they?' she had said, as she bustled away. But the look which she had bestowed on Martha, as she said the words, had been full of lingering tenderness which had often shone in her eyes during these days. "'Martha is maturing very well indeed,' she had confessed to Aunt Hannah, but a few days before." She did not know, but she was as good a choice on the whole as they could have had for the baby's mother. "'I should think as much,' the minister had said, but he laughed as he said it, and they had all laughed, and some way it was very easy to be patient with Aunt Hepsy nowadays. Tonight, though, Mattie's face had a tender sadness upon it. "'I thought I should hear from Elsie this evening,' she said. "'My heart aches for her. It seems so strange that we should have had to leave her just now in the hour of peril,' I cannot like to think of her as that man's wife, and yet I am afraid she will marry him. The world, the flesh, and her stepmother will be too much for her, I am afraid. John, dear, I really believe he is going to have dark hair like yours. I shall be so glad of that. Whom do you mean, Maddie? Alec Palmer? I had an impression that his was the last masculine you mentioned. This was the minister's merry reply and then they laughed a little, as people will sometimes, even when grave thoughts are pressing up behind the gaiety. John Remington's face sobered almost immediately. I hope he will be a better man than I have been, Mattie, and will be able to do some of his father's work, accomplish where I have failed. I hope he will preach the gospel, and will succeed in what I have only attempted. If he grows up to be as good and true and brave a man as his father, I shall be quite, quite satisfied. This from Mattie, with a firm clasp of the hand that was resting on her shoulder. I do not like to hear you say you have failed. If you have, the Lord Jesus did. They would not endure his preaching, you know. And beside, said Aunt Hannah, in the grim tone, which with her always covered strong feeling, you are rather young yet to be a patriarch. I've no objections to the child being as good a man as you please, and doing plenty of his own work, or rather the Lord's. But you two, John and Martha, have just begun life. It is all before you, as it were. Don't go to talking as though you had left it behind, and finished your course, and kept the faith, and were already watching out for the crown. You haven't got there yet, and it's more than likely you will have plenty of hard rubs and tugs before you do. And if I were you, I wouldn't try to shoulder too much of that child Elsie's burdens, either." not the Lord's end, I mean. I tell you, he'll take care of his own, even though you and I are not there to help. If he had wanted you by her side any longer, he would have had you stay. He manages things, 
Just let us remember that. John Remington reached forth his unoccupied arm and drew Aunt Hannah into his embrace as he said with a cheerful laugh, Aunt Hannah, what do you suppose Martha and I would do without your strong common sense to ballast us? Aunt Hepsy bustled in at the moment. I do wish you wouldn't talk and laugh right over his head, she said. It isn't good for a baby's nerves. The End End of Chapter 28 and End of Aunt Hannah and Martha and John by Pansy and Mrs. C. M. Livingston